Hello, I'm Andy and this is Maths the Fun Part. This is part two. Uh, part one was about sets. Uh, part two is about groups. Um, so let's jump straight in. Uh, yeah, so part one sets, part two groups. Let's jump to groups. Just a reminder on sets. Sets are just things that can contain other things. Like is it in it? Is it not in it? Um, go back and watch the video on sets if you want to find out more about that. But now that we've um, finished part one, we've learned about sets, we can get on to um, one of my favorite bits of maths which is groups and we're going to explain all this stuff using programming um, so this, like because this is like aimed at um, someone who likes programming thinks maths is either incomprehensible or boring or something else actually it's amazing uh, groups are one of my favorite bits let's get stuck in so let's talk about algebra um, this might already be putting off but bear with me so um, here's a sum um, and what we do when we do algebra is instead of writing actual numbers in our sum like this we write letters um, uh, to re you know, e replace numbers with letters and say uh, that's not just a concrete number. That's like could be anything. Um, but the question remains: What about this plus sign? Um, why are we using a like a concrete operation to combine these things together? Can we generalize that idea? And the answer is yes, we can. And groups are, are like the the first step towards uh, generalizing um, uh, sort of algebra uh, in this way. So yeah, let's uh, let's replace that plus sign with something some weird symbol, which I'm going to call dot if I remember through the rest of this um, uh, talk. Um, but yeah, basically the point is that could be anything. Could be plus, could be uh, times, could be something uh, weird that we haven't thought about yet. Um, but it's just a way of combining A and B to get a C. So this is like a core, this is the core idea of a group. Um, that it's like some operation that we, we don't know what it is yet. Uh, okay, so let's see some code. That was far too long without any code. Um, so here is um, like an interface that represents to some extent what a group is. So a group um, consists of a set. So that might be like a set of some numbers or it might be a set of some symbols or something else. We'll see some weird examples later. Um, but it's a set of some stuff. So the, a group always consists of some things, uh, which is what that first line is. And then the, the op part is that there's an operation which allows you to combine together two of those things and get a third one. So you take uh, a left and a right and you return something. Um, the examples are TypeScript, but um, hopefully that won't put you off if you don't know TypeScript. Basically, you can take some take two things which are in the set, uh, and then that op will return another thing which is also in the set. Um, and then the, the third part is an identity. An identity, um, we'll get onto what that means, but basically uh, it's, it's an, an element of the set that doesn't really do anything to the stuff you combine it with. Okay, so here's how we would say this in more mathematical language. A group consists of a set and an operation dot which follow some rules. So not just any old set and any old operation. They have to follow some rules. So let's go through um, the rules. But first of all, let's talk about an example of a binary operation. So this is the op part that we talk about. Uh, this is that dot thing. Um, so let's have an example of a group. Um, this is a group that I've called plus mod 5. And the, uh, we're only looking at the operation part of it now. We skipped over the set and the identity for the moment. But what plus mod 5 does is it takes in two things called left and right. And the, um, the operation, what it does is adds them together and then takes the answer modulo 5. So the answer will always be 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. So let's look at this in uh, operation, as it were. So we make a new um, instance of plus mod 5. And then we, um, we're just writing some unit tests for this. So... We do, we do the operation between 1 and 2, and we expect the answer to be 3. Because if you add 1 and 2, you get 3. And then we do the operation for 4 and 3. And the answer isn't 7, because we're doing modulo 5. So the answer is 2. So that's just our, this is our example group, plus mod 5. Um, and it like at the core of this whole thing is this binary operation, A dot B. So... Uh, we, we said that a group was a set and a binary operation. So plus mod 5 is the set of these numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and a binary operation, which is plus modulo 5. Okay, here are the rules. So the first rule um, is maybe so obvious or so simple as to be um, weird, but we need to be absolutely explicit about these things. So what we're saying is for every A and B in S, so that, that uh, remember from the previous talk, uh, that upside down A means for all. So that's like everything that satisfies these conditions. So we're saying for every A and B that are members of, of, of our set S, 
when you combine them together, so that's a dot b that on the bottom line there, when you combine them together, the answer is also a member of s. So that's what closed means. It means um, if you if you do the the operation on members of your group, um, you get another member of the group. It doesn't end up, you know, if we didn't have plus modulo five, we just had plus. Then when we added together three and four and got seven, that answer wouldn't be in the set because um, we said that the set was just number zero to four inclusive. So this rule just says um, the answers you get have to also be in inside the group. Um, so let's check that rule for um, plus mod five. So we first we when we defined plus mod five, we said it was a group, but really we need to do something similar to what we did with sets last time. If we want to say for all uh, and the kind of loop through the members of a group, we need to make this new thing called an iterable group. Um, and I won't define that. You can imagine how that's defined. Like basically, it's a group, but you can iterate through the members of the set. Um, and that allows us to do this this line at the bottom for x of g uh, to loop through all the members of g. That's all that is. Um, so now we can loop through the members of g. We can do something to check that the group is closed. So what we do is we loop through g and get x out of it, and we loop through again to get the y's. So now we've got two members of g, x, and y. And then we do the operation on them, and we get back an answer z. And then we, we assert that the set that, that is the that is G, that all the members of G contains Z. So that last line there, we're just asserting Z is Z is a member of G as well, or the set, a member of the set that is the members of G. Okay, so that's that's just our just us asserting that a, a, a particular group is closed. Um, and let's just think about plus mod five again. Is plus mod five closed? Well, yeah. Let's look at that three plus four example again. Um, when you add 3 and 4, you end up with 2, which is a member of the group. And if you try it out, um, you should be able to satisfy yourself pretty quickly that if you take any of the members of that set 0 to 4, uh, add them together, and then do modulo 5 on them, you'll end up with another thing that's 0 to 4. So yes, plus mod 5 is closed. And by the way, we will look at some other examples of groups, but we're using plus mod 5 as our kind of... Um, uh, just a, a, like a, a working example to understand these rules. Okay, so the second rule is called identity. So I, I, an identity is a thing that doesn't change things when you when you do the operation with that other thing. I haven't explained that very well, so let's look at the code. Um, so we're making a variable called IDT, which is the identity element of G. So the point of this rule is that this has to work for all members of G. So you, there's one thing called the identity of G, um, which is the identity for all the members of G. So we get hold of the identity, we loop through the members of G, put them into X, and then for each thing, each member of G, so for each X, um, when you combine IDT with X, you get X. And it doesn't matter whether you combine it with IDT first or IDT second, that's where there are two lines here. So the groups we've been thinking about so far, the order which in which you pass them into the operation doesn't matter, but it can matter, so that's why we have to check both cases here to say, um, if it's an identity element, it, you'll get x if you combine it with x on the left or on the right. Okay, um, so if we're going to do the maths to describe identity, we need this symbol, there exists. And I think this is the first time we've come across this symbol. So we, we've already done for all, which means everything, in, think about everything in that set. Uh, in this case, we need to say there exists. Um, so that means, um, well, let's use it in practice and it should make sense. So the identity rule is there exists an I, so there exists something called I, which is a member of the set such that for all I, for all A in S, when I combine A with I, I get A, and when I combine I with A, I get A. Um, so there exists just means like what the English words there exists mean, if you think about it the right way. Um, there is, a, there is a thing. There's something inside S. Uh, and how we express this in programming would be um, uh, slightly less kind of natural. Uh, you know, in, one of the nice things about math is that you can just declare something like there exists, and you don't have to say which one it is or how to find it. Um, but in, uh, in programming, you need to actually go through and find it. So we'll see that in a minute. Um, so let's just think about plus mod 5. So does plus mod 5 have an identity? Well, yes. The uh, 0 is the identity. So when you add 2 and 0, you get 2. When you add 0 and 2, you get 2. And the fact that the addition is modulo 5 here doesn't matter, but it still works. 
So yes, the zero is an identity for all the elements in plus mod five. It has this kind of pattern of rule that if you add it onto it, you get it back. So again, like this might feel like super obvious that like um, this thing will exist, but you could imagine some sets of numbers where there is no identity. Imagine if you did plus mod five, but you didn't have zero in the in the set, there wouldn't be an identity. Um, okay, so now we get onto inverses, which is maybe a little bit more interesting and not necessarily so obvious that it would exist. Um, so here's a little bit of code that, that, that doesn't tell us much, uh, but basically the rule is everything has to have an inverse. So we loop through all the x's and g, um, and it should have the x should have an inverse. So let's look at the has inverse function because that's going to explain what an inverse actually is. So here's the has inverse function. Um, so we're going to loop through all the members of g. So we've been given um, e, which is this um, this thing we're checking whether it has an inverse or not, and then we loop through all the members of G to get a Y. So now we want to say, um, if Y is the inverse of E, then the, the, this thing, these conditions will be true that are in yellow here. So um, if we combine E with Y, we get the identity. If we combine Y with E, we get the identity. Therefore, it does have an inverse because Y is the inverse, so we can return true. And if we've looped through all the Ys, um, and none of them is the identity, sorry, none of them is the inverse of E, So because you, when you combine them together with um, with E, you, you don't get the identity, uh, then there wasn't an inverse for E, so we, it didn't have an inverse. So the rule is everything has to have an inverse, right? So this is how we would say it in maths. We would say for all X that are members of S, there exists a Y that is also a member of S, and at such that this happens, which is that X dot Y equals the identity and Y dot X equals the identity. So again, the, why are we doing x dot y and y dot x is because in some cases those could actually give you different answers and we'll see an example of that. But in the case we're thinking about in plus mod 5, obviously it doesn't matter if you swap the numbers around um, either way. So the, that looks like a redundant rule here. But this is the like full rule. Um, for, every, for everything in S, there must be something else in S um, such that you can get back the identity by combining them together. And you can imagine how this is a, like a useful rule for doing arithmetic um, if you need to, um, you know, just like cancel something out, that kind of thing. Okay, so does plus mod 5 have inverses? Well, yeah, but they don't look how you might imagine. So like if you were thinking kind of loosely about numbers, you'd say that minus 2 would be the inverse of 2. But minus 2 doesn't exist inside plus mod 5. The only things that are in plus mod 5 are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, but it's okay. For every member of plus mod 5, we can find... Um, a number that gets us back to zero if we combine it together. And by the way, if you swap around the other sides of the plus, they still work. But yeah, we can add on three to two and we get back zero. So the inverse of two is three. Also, by the way, the inverse of three is two. Uh, and the inverse of four is one. Uh, yeah, so everything has an inverse. Uh, by the way, the inverse of zero is zero. So that still works too. Okay, so then there's another rule which is thought of a, a detail and not that interesting, which is called associativity. Um, but let's quickly talk it through. So let's do the maths part of it first. So for all x, y, and z in S, so imagine basically that says, imagine you've got three things um, that are all members of z. If we combine together x and y and then combine the answer with z, that's what the left-hand side of the, the bottom line means, then that is the same as combining together y and z um, and then combining that with x, so long as you keep the order. So the order might might matter, but uh, like like you couldn't swap round y and z and be guaranteed that it um, it would be the same answer. But just the order of bracketing shouldn't make any difference. So it, basically, what this means is that we don't need to write the brackets anymore because x dot y dot z is the same as x dot y dot z. Um, if that makes any sense. So basically, this just means we don't have to worry about the, the order in which we group um, operations. Uh, and so th something like plus works quite nicely for this, um, works fine. And then there are some operations like divides that doesn't work. So you can't use like a sort of standard division as your a binary operator in a group. Um, but yeah, you can see that from like from this example, the plus mod five is associative just because plus is associative. So you can add three, the three and the one together and then add on the two and you get the, the same answer as if you added the three and the two together and then added on the one. 
Uh, okay, and then there's another uh, rule which is optional. So you, this doesn't have to be true. There are groups that don't follow this rule, but this is a rule that some groups follow, which is that um, for all x and y in S, x dot y equals y dot x. So basically, it doesn't matter which way round you write them in the operation. So if a group follows that rule, we call it commutative, or even if you want to sound really posh, abelian. Um, but not all groups are commutative or abelian. Um, is plus mod 5 commutative? Well, yes, because 1 plus 3 is the same as 3 plus 1. Simple as that. So, yep, plus mod 5 is a commutative group. Um, so, you might be asking what groups are not commutative? Because how, well, how could you think of uh, like something that follows these rules but is not commutative? So, I want to show you an example of a group that's not commutative. And this is kind of the last, the last kind of deeply um, technical bit of this video. Um, we're going to like examine this group. But having spent all, a lot of time on plus mod 5, which is like a super simple group, we're going to look at another group which is also super simple, but it's like mind-bendingly different from plus mod 5. Like it doesn't even look like it's algebra. It looks like geometry. But um, the, the fun thing about it is that we, we, can, we can kind of take a little bit of a sort of geometric or like spatial thinking problem and turn it into something that looks like algebra, which means we have all the power of algebra. So, you know, that's what's cool. Um, if you're not getting why this is all cool, so cool and exciting fairly soon, then I've failed. Okay, so when I say, so this group is called D6, um, uh, but I call it things you can do to a triangle, but um, not all the things you can do to a triangle, um, but here are like some things you can do to a triangle and then it looks the same afterwards and it will specifically be an equilateral triangle. Um, so try not to think about the geometry of that. Try and think about the the language that I'm about to give you. So um, D6 consists of these members. These things. So its set of things that are in D6 is a, a bunch of like transformed triangles. So they still look the same after these operations. So the first one is do nothing to the triangle. So it still looks the same as um, how it started out. And then the next one along I've called ROT120, which is essentially rotate it uh, like a third of a turn around. And then um, the, the next one is ROT240, where we've, we've rotated it two thirds of a turn, or we've rotated it the opposite direction, depending how you think about it. Um, and then there's HFLIP, which it just flips flips it horizontally, like the, a, the B and the C get swapped. Um, and then there's top left flip, where we've flipped it kind of along a, an axis running from top left to bottom right. And top right flip, where we've flipped it along an axis running from top right to bottom left. And um, you may or may not believe me that that's all the ways you can kind of rotate and flip a triangle so that it still looks the same as how it did before. Um, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. Um, and the point is, these are just the sort of the members of the. the so the members of the group um, are. You can think of them as being the, the like rotations that you do to the triangle rather than like the final result. That would be the best way to think about this, right? So we can either do nothing to a triangle or we can rotate it once or we can rotate it twice or we can flip it this way, that way or that way. Um, and that is D6, like flipping uh, flipping and rotating triangles or doing nothing to them. Okay, so does this group follow the group rules? Well, let's find out. Well, well, actually, before that, let's think about um, the fact that this, the reason why I introduced this group is that it's non-commutative. So let's look at an example of that. So we have to, you have to think about um, how these things combine together and what they come up with, and it's not easy. So let's try and go through this slowly. So let's imagine we've got a triangle. We rotate it by 120 degrees, and then we horizontally flip. And the point is, for this group to be closed, that must end up being equal to another member of the group. And if you think about it carefully enough, it is. So what we do is we rotate it, so now we've got... Um, the A and the B at the bottom and the C at the top. And then we horizontally flip. So now the A and the B have swapped and the C stayed where it was. So now we've ended up with the C at the top and the A on the left and the B on the right. And that is actually um, uh, the same transformation as if we'd just done that top left flip, that TL, that TL flip, as if we just flipped A and C from the original triangle we had, because A was at the top, C was on the left. Um, so let me jump back to the list of all of them. So what we're saying is we do a, a ROT120 and then an H flip, and that equals a TL flip. So we do a ROT120 
and then an H flip, and that equals a TL flip. Um, but let's swap those two operations around. So instead of doing ROT120 H flip, let's do H flip and ROT120. So that way it means that we, we've swapped the B and the C, and then we've done a rotate. Um, and you can see the final result of that is that the B's at the top, A's on the right, uh, C is on the left. And the answer there is, is it, it, that's e equivalent to doing the top right flip from our original list of things. So you, like this, this is helping us to do two things. First of all, it's helping us to see that this thing is closed, because if you combine together two operations, you actually get something that's just equivalent to if you, if you just did one operation. Um, but also we can see that, that swapping them over on the two sides, um, the um, H flip and ROT120 versus ROT120 and H flip gives a different answer. It either gives us a TL flip or TR flip. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I didn't explicitly say when we when we have this plus here, what we're saying is do one thing, then do the next thing. So the, our, our binary operation here is combining together. First do one one rotation or one flip, then do the other rotation or one flip. And the answer is like whatever you would have, whatever operation could have got you there in just one operation instead of two. And there always is an answer. Because the reason there's always an answer is because we've listed all the possible ways that that triangle could have been transformed. So if you could, if you transform it twice, it is going to be equivalent to one of the transformations that only does it once. Okay, so um, I've probably explained that really, really badly. But um, yeah, uh, D6 is the, the ways you can rotate and flip a triangle. Um, when you combine together two of those things by doing one, then doing the other, you get one of the others. But if you combine them in the opposite order, you get different ones. So this group is not commutative. Okay, let's think about another non-commutative group. So it, uh, like in a way, a very, very similar idea. Um, if you think about uh, a Rubik's Cube, and you think about the different um, turns you can do in a Rubik's Cube, like I could turn the left-hand side or the right-hand side, um, then you get some um, members of this group. So this group is basically all the possible ways you can um, transform a Rubik's Cube, but it's not just, the members of this group are not just like I can turn the top or I can turn the left clockwise or whatever, it's all the possible ways of combining together by doing that that turn and then that turn and then that turn. Um, so as you can imagine, there are a lot of members of this group. All the, the members are just every possible way you can transform the cube by combining together turns. Um, uh, and and if you follow that through, you find that that is a group. Like you, like whatever you do, whatever turns and, and movements you do, you you still got a Rubik's cube. So you've, so it is closed. Uh, you can always invert by just doing the same moves backwards. The identity kind of exists because that's just like doing nothing. Um, uh, and the, it it turns out that the moves are associative. Um, so it is a group. How many members do you think this group has? Have a little guess. Uh, it's 43, I think that's quintillion. So that's quite a lot of, of members. So is this useful for solving a Rubik's Cube? Uh, probably not. Is it useful for thinking about um, non-commutative groups and the fact that they can be really big and still quite easy to understand? I mean, not easy to understand, but easy to construct, let's say. Like, like you can look at a Rubik's Cube and think, I do this move, then that move, then that move. But it turns out there are 43 quintillion possible uh, co combinations of moves you could have done. And if you just memorize them all, you'll be able to solve a Rubik's Cube. Okay, so that was a, uh, an example. Um, here's another example, and this one is um, more sort of abstractly mathematical. Um, we've been using like plus, plus mod 5 as our operation. Um, and plus is like often well, the group operation, but you can also make groups that do times. Um, and here we're talking about the real numbers. So the real numbers is just a massive set of um, all the kind of decimals that could ever exist. Uh, and we must we have to remove zero because um, when you're multiplying things together, zero has no inverse. So the identity element of in, in a multiplicative group is not zero um, because zero doesn't work. If you multiply stuff by zero, you don't get back the thing, you get zero. Um, so we don't, so zero is not the inverse. One is the inverse when we're multiplying things together. Sorry, identity. Uh, zero is not the identity. One is the identity uh, when you're multiplying things together. Um, and uh, that works fine. Like every number that you can think of, every kind of decimal number or anything like that, which is the real numbers, uh, has um, an inverse that will get it back to one. Because, for example, the inverse of three is a third. 
well, the inverse of a third is three, and the inverse of 10 is a tenth, and so on. So that works for everything except zero. So in order to talk about this set of numbers, the real numbers, as a group under multiplication, where the binary operation is multiplication, we have to take out zero. So if we think about the real numbers except for zero, it does work like a group. It is closed. Things do have inverses. The identity is one. Uh, it's associative. Um, it works. So um, that's an interesting way to think about the real numbers when you think about, you only think about multiplication, not any of the other things you can do to them. But of course, multiplication kind of includes division, right? Because you can, there's always a number that, like a third, which is like the inverse of three. So you can think of that as being like dividing by three, although it's not, it's just times by a third. Uh, if you still follow me. Okay, other examples. This is our last example, and this one I barely, I don't understand. So um, uh, I'm going to give you my very, uh, very uh, high level, um, low depth understanding of it. But they're elliptic curves, are, um, they're used in cryptography. They're really, really interesting thing. But they're essentially, um, or one way to think about them is is like uh, like where, where like curvy, three-dimensional space like crosses through a plane, I think, um, like at the points at which it kind of intersects with some plane that you're cut, chopping through it. Um, but another way to think of it is it's just like solutions to equations that look like the equations we've got here. So here we can see like when y squared equals x cubed minus x, um, the places where that's true are this kind of weird little circle and then another curve over to the right-hand side. So they're kind of odd-looking curves. Sometimes they're connected like the one on the right, sometimes they're not. Um, and they have they have really interesting properties that I don't understand, uh, and that's all I'll say because I'm already lost. Um, but the, you can make a group from these curves. So we haven't I haven't told you anything about how to make a group yet. So if you if you're wondering what on earth I'm on about, uh, that's fine because we'll get to it. So here is how you make a group from them. You basically take a point. So you've got you've got an elliptic curve, um, and you can make a group from it by saying if I, if you give me two points. So for example, if you give me p and q on the curve then I'm going to combine those together. My binary operation is going to be um, draw a line through P and Q and it, and it should, that line should cross the curve in another place. Um, and there are probably some cases where it doesn't, but most of the time it will. Um, where it doesn't, it's probably like, because two of them are like, it's actually in the same place as each other or something. So we, we'll try not to worry about that. But in, in most cases, when you've got, when you, you choose any kind of P and Q on the curve, um, draw a line through them and it will cross the curve in one other place which we'll call R and then weirdly you don't say R is the um, is the result of adding up P and Q or dot, you're using dot on P and Q like combining P and Q uh, we say minus R so minus R is just the point on the opposite side of the um, like so R is in the top right so minus R would be in the bottom left um, and when you do that that turns out that that is a group um, follows the rules of groups and you can do amazing things. And I even think it might be related to how you do elliptic curve crypto cryptography, but I'm not sure. So um, there are like all kinds of weird and wonderful groups. Groups get really um, strange. There, There's like, um, the, you have infinite groups, but you also have finite groups. And the finite groups have been classified um, into like different sets of them. And then there's some weird ones that don't quite fit in with the, the classification and you just wouldn't have imagined that some such a simple idea as being able to combine together two things and get a third thing that's also a member of the group would turn out to be so irregular and strange. It also gets used in all kinds of stuff like physics and things, but we don't care about like things being useful. We only care about them being interesting. So I hope you found this interesting. Um, here are some links to some more interesting things. Um, and so that was part two. We're going to, there are going to be three parts. The third part is about graphs, uh, which are nothing like nothing to do with charts or um, like statistics or anything like that. Graphs are like a really abstract idea that I also really like. Um, if if you like uh, these videos, you want to see other areas of maths, please suggest them in the comments. Maybe there's some other areas of maths that I find exciting that you would like to find out more about. Um, maybe there'll be more than these three, but for now it's just going to be the three. So I hope you enjoyed. Um, thanks a lot. See you next time.